A surge in U.S. bond yields, expected inflationary pressures and trade tensions. It's the return of Donald Trump and it is sending ripples through global markets. Hello, I'm Jeremy Maggs. This is No Ordinary Wednesday. It's our in-depth look at what's driving markets, shaping the economy and changing the game. In this episode, Investec Chief Economist in South Africa, Annabel Bishop, and Economist at Investec UK, Ellie Henderson, will give their analysis of the reactions to Trump's second presidency. Now, you'll know that he's promised to impose high tariffs on imports, particularly from China, a move that will have far-reaching consequences for the global economy. On the other hand, his promise to reduce corporate tax bodes well for equity markets. So to help make sense of the Trump effect, let me welcome you both to have a look at what the next four years holds in store for the global economy. Ellie, Annabelle, welcome to No Ordinary Wednesday. All right, uh, Ellie, let me begin with the international picture, if I can. It's been a week there or thereabouts since Donald Trump's win, a move that has or was already very much priced in, I think, by global markets. However, with the election outcome coming in faster than traders anticipated, we did see a big surge in U.S. stocks. Give me the sense here. Have markets since settled? Yeah, so as you said, leading up to the US election, financial markets did appear to start pricing in the chance of a Trump victory. We saw elements of the Trump trade in force. We had US equities gaining, we had US treasuries selling off. But I don't think the result was fully priced in. Better markets certainly were pointing to a Trump victory, but the opinion polls were very close. It seemed like it was going to be neck and neck. So I think what was a surprise wasn't necessarily that Trump won, but as you said, it was the extent at which he did so. We we thought it would be a tight race. We didn't expect to wake up in London on Wednesday morning to hear Trump give his acceptance speech. But equity markets seem to react positively to the news of a Trump victory. That's as we expected. His policies are quite pro-business. They're business friendly. You've got the 15% corporation tax rates that Trump is proposing for companies that produce in America. And the S&P 500 closed last week up 5%. Markets did settle slightly, as you say, to Towards the end of the week and now really is a waiting game for his full policy agenda. But what we would say and what we've been communicating to clients is markets weren't just reacting to who was president, but also the results of the House and the Senate races. At the time of recording, it's looking like the Republicans are on course for a clean sweep. What does that mean? Well, it means they've won the presidency, the House and the Senate, and that means they can get policies through Congress a lot easier and up to his desk to sign when he is inaugurated on January the 20th. Now, Ellie, we also know the Fed cutting interest rates further last week, 25 basis points, but analysts are saying that a Trump presidency could derail the downward rate trajectory with the risk of his uh, proposed tariffs or trade tariffs pushing inflation back up. So give me a sense of how you're feeling in that respect and are you concerned then about inflation in the United States? Yeah, so when it became obvious it was going to be a Trump victory, we had to look at our forecasts and assess where we thought, you know, the key asset classes were going. What we didn't want to do was jump to quick conclusions when really we don't know what a Trump presidency this time round will look like. But what we did know was from the broad gist of the agenda that he laid out in his campaign was that his policies would be inflationary and providing the Fed remain independent, they would have to counteract that. And that's not necessarily by raising rates. We are in an easing cycle, but it could be by reducing rates at a slower pace than maybe if Kamala Harris won at the election. So what we've done in our forecasts is we've opted to take two of our 25 basis point cuts out of our forecast that we had in for next year. So now we see the Fed funds rate target range end next year at 3.75 to 4 percent. And Ellie, just before I bring Annabelle Bishop into the conversation, how is this going to impact global growth? I don't need to mention that it is lackluster, to say the least. What about the global inflation outlook? Yeah, this Trump presidency is key for not just the US, but also global markets and the global economy. We think that the tariffs proposed by Trump, so a 60% tariff on China and a 10 to 20% universal tariff on countries elsewhere would hurt global economic growth. The IMF has actually put some figures on this, saying that the proposed tariffs could shave around 0.8 percentage points off of global growth. But we're hesitant to conclude definitively that this will be the number. As 
as we've seen countless times before all over the world, election campaign promises are not always enacted or enacted to the same degree. We wonder if Trump will use the threat of tariffs as a bargaining tool to win some concessions, and then the hit in that case to global growth would be less. But the recent appointment of Robert Lighthizer to once again head up his trade policy does cause some concerns because he does have that reputation on the hit to global inflation that really depends on how countries respond and whether they slap a tariff straight back on the US in a tit-for-tat move. But I think that really sums up the fact that there's still a vast number of known unknowns that we'll have to think about as time progresses. And now to emerging markets like South Africa. Annabel Bishop, how worried, in your opinion, should we be about inflation in our corner of the world? You expect inflation to be below the target range in the short term to normalize at around 4.5% in the longer term. But what's your thinking? Could a Trump presidency derail this? Yes. Hi, Jeremy. Look, I think, you know, we're doing very well at the moment from an inflation perspective. The next print is likely to come out towards 3%. And of course, you know, well below the 4.5% midpoint of the target range, if you will, or actually now just the target itself. So we find ourselves in South Africa, you know, having seen quite a sharp disinflationary trend recently. But over the past few years, it's been fairly lengthy to get inflation down. Clearly, we're benefiting from base effects economically. And we do expect to see inflation remain below 4% in the next three prints, in fact, out to December. So, you know, we really are in a particularly low inflation period. Next year, inflation actually also is likely to be below 4% for at least five months. So, you know, overall, we're actually undershooting the target, not overshooting. And I think perhaps that might be the Reserve Bank's concern at the moment. They're certainly likely to cut interest rates in November and possibly into January as well because of these factors. And, you know, with the slowing of the US interest rate cut cycle with less likely to now happen, happen in the US because of the Trump presidency, because of higher anticipated inflationary pressures there, the worry for South Africa is we could actually see some rand weakness. And of course, you know, Jeremy, that's what's been happening recently. We've been seeing a widening within the differential, that from an expectation perspective. So, you know, really, we are a little concerned about the rand from our forecast perspective. The rand could be weaker than we were hoping for next year. You know, over the next couple of years, the rand was expected to actually pierce the 16 rand to the US dollar mark and coming in closer, you know, towards 15. Now, of course, we've seen even recently this month, the rand has tended to stagnate around 17 and a half to the US dollar. So, you know, these are concerns for inflation next year. I think to answer your question, in the short term, we're expecting inflation to undershoot the target. In the medium term, to remain around target. For South Africa, you know, while we're a small open economy, we do have some benefits. We are food sufficient. What will be particularly important to us is what happens internationally with oil prices. And, you know, that has been a big reason for the downward momentum in CPI inflation recently. Looking forwards, um, you know, much will depend on the foreign policies of the Trump presidency. Worries, obviously, about a resurgence of geopolitical tensions could see the oil price rise. And that does tend to feed through quite directly into higher inflation. So I would say it's an uncertain and volatile outlook. But certainly in the near term, even over most of you know next year, inflation is likely to undershoot. We don't have concerns there. And Annabel, let's talk about one of those policies, or at least proposed policies, Donald Trump's plans to impose heavy tariffs on imports. What's your sense in terms of impact on global growth, and particularly, again, for South Africa? You know, the the concerns already are coming through China, undershooting in terms of growth expectations, particularly the stimulus measures, seen as highly disappointing. So I think for South Africa as well, while we do depend on international commodity prices, particularly for export growth, obviously it feeds through into our government revenues as well. We've just had the medium term budget policy statement. All of those are concerns. If we look at global economic growth itself, the US does tend to have a very large impact. And of course, there as well, you know, expected to see a bit of gains in the early stages from deregulation and, of course, as well, tax cuts. But looking forward over the course of the next few years, there are worries about the impact of tariffs on U.S. growth. Of course, you know, the impacts of trying to do onshoring, you know, the protectionism brought in, you know, for that purpose. Higher inflation, obviously, coming you know through from the tariffs themselves, but also, of course, as well, worries that new industry might not spring up as quickly as anticipated to, you know, take over some of the weight, if you will. And, you know, in general, we're not expecting to see a strong global growth year next year or in the medium term. We're expecting to see a fairly modest outcome below trend values. And of course, that has an impact on South Africa. But most importantly for South Africa, Jeremy, as you know, much will depend on what occurs with our freight transport 
And of course, that's port and rail. And we obviously still see an ongoing crisis there. It's not something that can be resolved in the immediate or near term. So that's also going to be very important for South Africa economic growth as well. And of course, you know, even if global commodity prices do see substantial strength, which is not the expectation, if we're lacking the infrastructure to export out to that, that doesn't mean we get the full benefits. So, you know, these remain the lingering worries for South Africa that we still have such a severe freight crisis. Annabelle Bishop, back to you in just a moment. We are going to continue this conversation with a look at reaction from the fixed income market. But uh, before we do that, a quick congratulatory note to our sister podcast series on Investec Focus Radio SA, The Current. It's won gold in the business category at the South African Podcast Awards. If you want to hear from the experts about all the ins and outs on South Africa's energy transition, listen to The Current on investec.com forward slash the current. Let's get back to the podcast now. This is No Ordinary Wednesday and Ellie Henderson, back to you. So we've touched on the interest rate outlook for the United States, but uh, let's broaden the scope slightly. How do you see Trump's win impacting other key markets like the UK and Europe, for instance? Thanks, Jeremy. I think that's a really interesting question. We have this saying in markets that when the US sneezes, the world catches a cold. And that's referring to the fact that typically when US markets move, we see European markets move in a similar way. So what we thought was fascinating on the election results was the divergent move in interest rate markets between the US and in Europe. In the US, it seems there was very much a focus on the inflationary impact of Trump's policies and how this might be countered with a less aggressive easing cycle from the Fed. But over in Europe, the focus seemed to be on the potential hit to growth that would stem from a Trump presidency and from a move to a more protectionist world, as Annabelle touched on and I said previously. And this actually resulted in bond yields in Europe falling when they were rising in the US. But I think another key point for Europe in particular is geopolitical. What we don't know currently is how in a Trump world, will Europe have the same level of support from the US for conflicts around the world, particularly that in Ukraine, or the same enthusiasm for some of the organisations such as NATO or a cross-border climate effort, and how Europe plans to navigate this does remain to be seen. And Ellie, you mentioned bond yields, as you say, a surge initially. How do you see this playing out? Do you expect it to continue in coming months? And if so, what would drive that? We discussed bond yields as part of our broad think on the direction of key asset classes. And we think that US bond yields will continue to head higher over the next year or so, maybe reach around 5% on the 10-year US Treasury yield by N25. Part of that will likely be driven by the inflationary impulse that comes from some of the fiscal measures, but also fiscal concerns in the long term. The Western world does seem to become an increasingly attentive to fiscal risks. You just have to, in the UK, particularly look back to that disastrous Liz Truss mini budget or look over in France at the fractured political system over there at the minute and the impact that that could have on the fiscal space. If the Congressional Budget Office are correct, Trump's policies are set to raise US debt significantly over the coming years. And we do question at what point investors will say that really enough is enough. And we think that will be reflected in higher bond yields. And Annabelle, what about uh, local bonds? Yes. So, you know, we've just come through our most recent budget update. And of course, you know, we saw a slightly higher borrowing projection. Our bonds have not gained substantially um, recently. Instead, the big gain this year came post-election. And of course, that's when we saw South African benchmark 10-year government bond moving from above 12% to around 10%, if not slightly below 10% at the end of September. And of course, you know, recently there's been a slight downtick. I think we attribute quite a bit of that to the fact that we actually are seeing such low inflation figures. And of course, you know, in South Africa now, markets wondering, is South Africa going to have a deeper and longer interest rate cut cycle, while in the US you're getting a shorter and, you know, shallower cycle. So all of these factors obviously quite key for our bonds, but we can't get away from the fact, Jeremy, that our bond yields remain high especially compared to the 2000s when we actually saw our benchmark yield at 6%. And of course, the reason for that is the huge escalation in supply, absolutely enormous escalation in borrowing that we've seen over more than a decade. All of these factors obviously are not going to go away quickly or easily. In fact, South Africa is projected to borrow out over the next several years at a similar ratio to GDP. So we don't think there's going to be substantial move in South Africa's government bond yields. Of course, you know, an upward drift in 
in US bond yields, US treasuries, 10 years treasuries would also have a little bit of impact on our government bond borrowing. But of course, overall, we remain beholden by our structural problems, and that is just a very heavy debt burden. And Annabelle, a little earlier, you did reference the price of oil, but uh, maybe a little more amplification. Are you concerned about the oil market moving forward? Not at the moment. We have seen a little bit of volatility in oil, and I think that's quite normal. We've been lucky to see RAND strength post-election in South Africa, and of course also bolstered by the start of the US interest rate cut cycle. That has helped us as well, substantially in terms of inflation. You know, again, we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of definitive forecasts for Trump foreign policy. We have seen comments coming out from his office that they are looking to support NATO. And we've obviously seen him have communications with the Ukraine, also um, told that communications rust. But overall, we do expect to see that we will probably on a longer term basis see oil prices remain supported. We obviously have experienced over the past few decades that OPEC plus the oil cartel has really been an operation to limit supply, to keep prices elevated. I think what's possibly key Jeremy, is that on the environmental front with Trump and, of course, the Republicans seem to show less support for mitigation towards climate change, that there obviously is the risk to see fossil fuel usage for longer. Of course, obviously, that's also feeding through into energy prices as well. But for South Africa, we're not overly concerned. What would be a great win for South Africa would be to actually explore and extract our own oil off the West Coast. We have seen to have sizable reserves of both oil and gas, given that oil is our main import in our country. And of course, that would be a key game changer, both in terms of the RAND and, of course, you know, the impact that that would have on, on inflation and economic growth. So, you know, there are a lot of potentials and possibilities for South Africa on the horizon, but I think we just need to have a change in mindset around government in terms of making it attractive for foreign investors to come in and work on our oil fields. And Ellie, talking about uh, potentials and possibilities, obviously a lot of negative press about the return of Donald Trump to the White House, but I'm wondering if you see any upsides. Some of the press has indeed been negative, as you say, but some of the press has been positive too. And one thing we would say is that if Trump does manage to get a clean sweep, then he will avoid some of the political gridlock that we've seen over the past few years with the split Senate and House. We would also comment that corporations that benefit from this 15% corporation tax rate that's been proposed will also see that as a win. And more broadly, Trump's policies, as Annabelle said, do look to boost US GDP growth, at least in the short term, this won't only be to the benefit of Americans, but could also benefit the rest of the world through higher demand for imports. Of course, you have to question the relative impact of that to the downside hit from tariffs, but it could at least soften some of that effect. So there are positives to be made of the situation. Ellie Henderson, along with Annabel Bishop, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of No Ordinary Wednesday. And please join us again in two weeks' time as we continue to explore money trends shaping your world. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, simply search for Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts and hit the subscribe button. Also, don't forget our podcasts are now on YouTube. Until next time, goodbye from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire family. Focus Radio Team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long term insurer.